Good evening, friends, and a very warm welcome to HSBC's special session on responsible investments and climate change. I am your host for the evening, Karun Muta, Head of Investment Insights at HSBC Bank, and uh, welcome you to the session. We think investors today have a very strong case to demand more action from businesses and governments to implement decarbonization me measures. For companies involved in higher carbon activities, the demand is to uh, the demand is to rethink on the business models and the strategies, as well as providing more investor transparency by adopting the stronger ESG principles. We have today with us two experts uh, from the uh, respective fields, and in fact, uh, they are closely associated with climate change, sustainable investment, and responsible investing. And uh, let's hear it from our experts what they think about. Uh, uh, the uh, strategies that the business models need to adopt to, uh, sus uh, to for having a sustainable investment opportunities for investors. Uh, to start with, we have Andrea Griffin. Andrea joined uh, the responsible investment team in HSBC Asset Management in 2021. She previously worked in HSBC Group Sustainable Finance team, where she helped to define and implement the group sustainable finance and investment strategy across business lines. Uh, she published multiple reports for HSBC Center uh, of Sustainable Finance on transitioning hard to bait sectors like steel cement, ways to achieve net zero emerging uh, opportunities. Uh, Andrea holds uh, a master's degree from Columbia University and is a team member of the Council of Foreign Relations. She previously served on the Energy Transition Commission. Today, uh, joining Andrea, we have William NG. Uh, Will, as we lovingly call him, is an ESG engagement analyst in, uh, in the investment team with HSBC Asset Management Hong Kong and responsible for engaging uh, the uh, Asian companies and supporting the investment team on ESG integration and research. Uh, Will started his uh, career as a chartered accountant and risk assurance in London before hand, uh, finding his passion into sustainability. Prior to joining uh, HSBC, Will worked as a sustainability, con sustainability consultant in Hong Kong and uh, supporting corporates with training, uh, stakeholders, engagement, facilitating, and uh, research on the subject. Williams has obtained his master's degree in environmental technology at the Imperial College London and is an ICAEW chartered accountant. So welcome, Andrea, and wel welcome, William. Uh, we have a small presentation, and this will be followed by a question and answer session. Participants who wish, wish to answer, uh, uh, put any questions to our speakers may uh, put their questions in the comments uh, section or the chat box. There is a Q&A window provided up out there. So uh, without much ado, let's begin with Andrea. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karun, and it's a real delight to be with you all. Um, and one thing I didn't actually realize I mentioned in the bio, but I actually started my sustainability career uh, originally working in solar energy in, um, in India. So I was working for a solar energy company for a couple of years living in Bangalore. Um, and that was in kind of the 2010, 2011, 2012 phase when, when solar was really just getting built up. So it's a real delight. I got to work in India for about a decade um, before, I, before I joined HSBC on the renewables side. So it's a real delight to be here with you all. Um, so I think just pulling up the deck, um, we can start off with a, an overview of what, of what the climate challenge is really all about. And, um, and if we move on to the, the first slide, please. <clears throat> 
we'll run through um, kind of a couple of sections, both myself and Will. I'll start off with an overview of what, um, of what we're facing in terms of what the challenges around climate, as well as around what the opportunities look like. Um, and understanding exactly what we mean when we say things like net zero and um, low carbon transition, um, but then understanding how that links back to um, investments, uh, specifically around um, ESG, which is a, a very fast growing investment space. It's actually one of the largest, um, fastest growing um, uh, asset classes and strategies um, globally. And then getting into a little bit about what is HSBC doing about it as a group, both across our global banking, commercial banking, as well as in our asset management. Um, and then Will will take us through um, kind of the more particulars around Asia and ESG um, and some of our activities on the ground. So we can get started from there. So just to give a, a bit of an overview, um, when, you know, when we think about climate change, um, we're facing a very um, significant challenge in front of us, but this is also an opportunity. In fact, um, HSBC Asset Management, the way we look at sort of the, the climate challenges. It's also one of the largest, um, biggest investment opportunities I think we'll find um, ahead of us. And there will be a lot of innovation, a lot of interesting uh, new developments across different sectors of the economy. But to give you an overview of kind of what we mean by um, low carbon transition and effectively what we mean by um, net zero, which is one of the stipulations of the Paris Agreement. And we're going to be having um, a big event later in November, as many of you probably know with COP26, uh, where nations around the world will come together to really then redefine their national con uh, national targets as well as kind of strategies to get to those targets. But essentially what we're doing is sort of at the beginning of, if you look at this slide here, really what this is showing us is that we need to drastically reduce our emissions um, in order to be compliant with the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement says that we should aim to be um, at least below two degrees above uh, above pre-industrial times in terms of in terms of temperature increases, ideally 1.5 degrees below two, ideally 1.5. Um, but we're not on track to get there. And in fact, a recent report that came out last week, which I think many of us are um, kind of saw in the headlines, is that uh, we're we'll be lucky if we even kind of get to the, the 1.5 if, if two is is already a, quite a challenge. Um, that we're just essentially not on track. And so what this really means is that we, if you look at this graph, you'll see that we need to both um, reduce our emissions across the entire economy to net zero by 2050. So that's over the next three decades. That while also growing the economy um, across all the different markets. So it's a huge challenge from that perspective, growth as well as low carbon transition, reducing the emissions associated with that growth. Now, if we think about kind of that 2050 target and you see that net zero um, line at the very bottom there, what is really key here is, is really in the next decade, um, 2030 or 2050 is 30 years out from now. What we also really need to be focused on is sort of the next decade between now and 2030. This is going to be a critical time for us. If you look at this graph here, you'll see that red line essentially is showing that we'll need to reduce almost half of our emissions um, from today from today's current levels, we'll need, we'll need to reduce that to almost half by 2030. Now that's gonna have to, have to happen I really pretty much across all sectors of the economy. Some will be much easier to decarbonize than others. Some of them might be a little bit after 2030, between 2030 to 2035. But essentially what we're really trying to do here is this next decade will be critical to building up the kinds of infrastructure that's low carbon, transitioning some of these business models to really then set us on pace after 2030 to get to those, those commitments. So yeah, next slide. So um, if you think about kind of how are we approaching this issue? What are some of the, um, the big tickets? What are countries really doing to um, address this challenge? So you'll see on the left-hand side that the majority of emissions are kind of concentrated across a couple of different countries, um, China, the US, uh, across the EU and India. Um, and then on the right hand side, you'll see that, you know, a number of these countries have all, either already set net zero targets or are reviewing their plans to do so, but if not, have already made significant, um, uh, significant inroads into creating the kinds of policies that can help with transition. So in the case of China, they made an announcement um, earlier uh, recently actually about achieving net, uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 or sooner and actually peaking those emissions there their emissions by 2030. And so that's a, you know, that's a big, big step. With the US and Biden now, um, the administration has um, basically re-pledged to, to commit to the Paris Agreement. 
um, and is in introducing a rather large infrastructure bill to help really focus on low carbon infrastructure. Uh, similarly with the EU and their carbon neutrality target, India has made, I would say, one of the most interesting countries from a renewable standpoint. Um, they were quite, um, quite active early on developing um, pretty ambitious growth targets around uh, solar um, and also renewables in general and have been uh, really kind of building up capacity quite quickly and we're seeing um, we're seeing that have a trickle down effect across all the different ways that can lead to decarbonization across the country. So next uh, next slide please. So if we think about what do we mean by net zero um, and, and we know what we mean, we mean reduce emissions by 50% around 50% over the next decade and then to net zero by by 2050, how do we do that? So if you look at the right-hand side of this chart, what you'll see is that it's easiest, I think, to focus in our head um, when we think about the structure around where are the emissions currently sitting today? Where are the bulk of those emissions currently sitting? And if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see that we have certain sectors that are um, quite significant when it comes to their contribution to, to carbon. Power is, of course, a, a big one. Um, and what you'll see there is um, a shift from traditionally thermal coal now more and more into the renewable space. Um, traditionally, renewables have been about 10% or so of, of, um, of uh, generating capacity and power. We're going to want to get that to about 80% um, by 2050. So that's a huge, you know, massive increase in the in the renewable space. Um, again, transport um, is another big contributor. Heavy industry is actually um, a significant contributor. It's also a very challenging sector to decarbonize um, because it's uh, relying heavily on the combustion of um, fossil fuels to produce high intensity heat for production processes. So steel, cement, um, chemicals, um, but it's not necessarily completely able to get to net zero through electrification. Um, that being said, um, there's new kinds of technology innovations that could really help the indus industrial sectors. Those are things like green hydrogen, which uh, we'll, we'll be talking about later, as well as carbon capture and storage. Um, and then a, another um, contributor is also real estate, um, real estate infrastructure. And if you think about sort of the carbon footprint of the buildings that we inhabit, um, you know, the bridges that we use, a lot of them are using materials in cement, um, steel. These are very hard, heavy carbon emitting materials that, you know, the industrial sector is producing. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to start to really focus on when we think about really moving the needle when it comes to carbon emissions. <clears throat> so if you look at um, so if you look at um, this this slide here, so even if every sector does everything they're supposed to do and gets to net zero, um, including the really challenging ones like the ones I mentioned, the, the industrial sectors, even if all of those sectors do get to net zero, the timeline of when they do that in terms of you know how fast they're able to do that um, and by what um, by what years, there will there will still be emissions in the um, resid what we call residual emissions by 2050. Um, at the moment, the Energy Transitions Commission is measuring them between three to five gigatons per annum, but that number is still kind of getting figured out as we as we go. It's, it's fairly um, fairly recent research. But um, but there will also be you know instances in the economy where we won't completely phase out um, all carbon emitting types of energy sources. And so we'll still have to use carbon capture and storage. So for those areas where we still have emissions, we're going to need to determine or figure out ways to actually abate them. And there's a couple of areas uh, and ways we can do that. One is just through um, carbon capture and storage where you basically remove carbon and then sequester it underground or use it <clears throat> across other different kinds of sectors. Um, the cement industry is actually doing some quite interesting stuff around uh, what they call carbon capture utilization. Um, as, as is the chemical sector. Other um, ways to do that are through nature-based solutions. So essentially planting a lot more trees, um, uh, enabling a lot more land to not use, uh, basically putting more plants in availability of um, uh, bioresources to essentially absorb carbon from the atmosphere. So that'll have an impact on things like agriculture, food production, uh, the way we eat, et cetera, et cetera. But what the kind of key message is here is that we're gonna start to see the value of natural capital kind of become more and more interesting, more and more valued by the market because it can sequester those residual carbon emissions. And you'll start to see some interesting products um, as well in the asset management space. Uh, we um, in uh, HSBC Asset Management actually just recently launched uh, climate asset management um, uh, joint venture and have a new fund coming out called the Pollination Fund, which is addressing just this here. So next slide, please. 
So if you think about kind of what this then means from an investment perspective and, and you know, where do we see the dollars most needed and most um, likely going towards? So it's no surprise kind of looking at the previous data I showed you that um, we have about a hundred trillion dollar investment requirement estimated um, between now and the next decade. So, you know, the 2020s will be key. Um, a predominant amount of that will be in Asia. So we're gonna see a lot of investment requirement in countries like China, um, across um, Asia Pacific, as well as India, as well as Europe and um, uh, US. And then on the right hand side, this kind of gives you sort of a snapshot of where some of the big ticket dollar items are gonna be. Um, like I said, kind of like you saw before with clean power or rather power being one of the big contributors to carbon emissions. Um, decarbonizing the power system will be will be a big um, investment requirement. So that's both in um, increasing the amount of renewables we have, but also building a much larger power system. Um, we're going to go from about 20% total electrification to about 70% of all econ of all economic sectors being electrified. So that's going to be about a 5x increase in the total size of the power system. And most of that we're going to want to have as renewables. So this just gives you an idea of kind of where a lot of um, investment needs will, will start to reflect themselves. And these are the kinds of things we'll start to hopefully also see happening in investment portfolios and on um, new investment products. Next slide, please. So um, when we think about you know, the next decade, um, what's really key is scaling up these types of low carbon um, uh, business models and infrastructure projects. And in the past, what we've had happen is, Generally, what you've seen is for very low carbon technologies, things like green hydrogen, um, a number of different kinds of bioresources, blue hydrogen, which is another kind of hydrogen, which is uh, taking natural gas, combining that um, to then produce um, blue hydrogen. But essentially what you're looking to do here is really you want to scale up the, um, the size of projects and enable the economies of scale to come down so that they're at closer cost parity with traditional fuels. Now, a way to do that is to look at clusters of industries. So you have supply of, you know, whatever the, the production supply is, in this case, um, green hydrogen. So you're, you know, creating uh, renewables, let's say offshore wind, converting that to green hydrogen, and then feeding that to a number of different sectors like steel, cement, chemicals, um, that can then use that to, to decarbonize their processes. When you kind of link the, the whole value chain together, you'll get a faster economies of scale come down, but then you'll also see much bigger ticket sizes in terms of investment dollars required. And then you'll also see faster scale up in terms of um, many different industries can actually start to implement these decarbonizing technologies um, than would otherwise be the case if it was just kind of a one-off hydrogen project here or one-off hydrogen project there. So, um, so that's just one of the new, interesting, exciting uh, innovations that are happening. I would say it's really just happened in the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So I will just make a quick mention that, um, you know, regions that are looking at clusters um, are really coming out quite strong. So the UK has been um, very active in its approach to, okay, we have a carbon, uh, we have a net zero ambition. How do we get there? Clusters is one of the way to do that. Um, and actually India, what's super um, exciting about India is that India, because of the success it's had in the renewable space, the, pr the prices for renewable power, for solar power in particular, are quite competitive and relatively the most competitive around the world. And so what that's really enabling is actually things like hydrogen, especially green hydrogen potentially, to get developed and come um, down the cost curve much more quickly than in other countries. Um, I think BETC, which is one of our thought partners, um, has actually estimated that it could be cost um, competitive with fossil fuels by 2030, possibly sooner. And that could have a huge impact on things like chemical steel, agriculture, and they're looking at ways to address those through clusters. So it's a very, India is kind of doing some quite innovative um, thinking around this. Next slide, please. So I'll make a, a quick mention of just how HSBC is approaching um, the transition. Um, as you all know, we're, we're a fairly large organization, a big bank. Um, we kind of think of the, um, the transition as essential to our business model and essential to how we support our clients. Um, we ourselves have made um, a net zero uh, climate aligned finance pledge to reach net zero in all of our financing by 2050 or sooner. And that also means, um, uh, can mean to at least 750 billion in uh, sustainable finance 
uh, over the next decade. Um, so how we kind of think about it is we have three categories on the right hand side. The first is really transition finance and that's working directly with our global banking, commercial banking um, businesses to help, uh, help our clients uh, decarbonize through things like green bonds, um, green loans, uh, different kinds of advisory for mergers and acquisitions, um, supply chain financing. And so that's kind of where we're putting dollars to work with our clients on um, specific decarbonizing um, activities they may be taking on. Um, and then sustainable infrastructure similarly is, a, is, an, is another avenue that we follow. We're actually a, a signatory and leader in the Fast Infra um, initiative, which is the first green or sustainable label for um, uh, being developed for sustainable infrastructure. And so this could have a big uh, you know, um, facilitating impact on helping build up the sustainable infrastructure space so that when investors and asset managers are developing sustainable infra infrastructure funds and sourcing projects, they're able to know kind of what can, what's considered a sustainable project, which is, and which is considered maybe not as sustainable. So it helps kind of scale up, um, scale up the industry for that. And then the last part is really on the investments and sustainable investments. And this is where WPB and asset management um, play an essential role in really driving this forward um, at HSBC. So next slide, please. And I'm almost at time, so I'll be very quick because I know Will has a, a lot of good detail to get into on this. But HSBC Asset Management, so we've been doing this since 2006 in terms of sustainable investments. Uh, we were one of the early um, uh, movers in the space. We, um, since 2006, have had an actual uh, fairly high A plus rating from the PRI. Um, uh, which recognizes sort of our ability to both um, innovate and also lead on things like ESG integration. Um, in the last year, we've actually made some interesting, um, actually more than a year now, but we've actually done some quite um, exciting work in terms of new pledges. We made a um, biodiversity pledge, uh, which will be um, in place to help protect and restore um, biodiversity through our investments by considering it as a, um, a consideration in our investment analysis and process. Uh, we've also made a net zero commitment um, pledge as well as of this summer, uh, which we'll talk uh, quickly about at the end, um, but that's a, an essential move for the asset management industry and one that we're also taking on ourselves. Um, we've done quite a lot of engagement across different um, industry uh, companies that we also have in our portfolios. Um, you'll see here that we've done about um, 86,000 uh, resol resolutions voted on um, and a number of issues on ESG um, as well discussed and engaged on with our clients. And we've also developed a number of different new funds in the last year and a half. We have 11 sustainable funds launched across all parts of the portfolio. We have the core as well as sort of the impact side, um, as well as some really interesting and innovative thinking around um, natural capital, which is similar to those residual emissions slide I showed you earlier through our um, pollination fund. So we can move on to the next slide real quick. So I think um, what I may do here is just give a very big, uh, very broad overview of the process. And then I know Will is gonna get into a much more kind of granular detailed look at how, it, how it's actually applied. But just to give you an idea of how we think about sustainable investments. So ESG from our, um, from our vantage point, and I think this is fairly now um, believed across the board is that ESG um, can have a fundamental risk on um, the valuation and performance of companies that we invest in over the long term, but can also position them for potential upside and return and opportunity. So understanding kind of the materiality of different environmental, social and governance factors on the intrinsic value of a company is, um, is critical to our investment process. So we consider ESG analysis, which is kind of what we call ESG integration. We consider ESG analysis uh, very much alongside financial analysis. And our ESG analysts work closely with our investment teams to embed ESG in the investment analysis, research, data, as well as um, uh, investment decision-making process. And so you'll see here that on the left-hand side, this integration process kind of combines both um, third-party research and ESG data scores with our own proprietary um, uh, what we're now doing proprietary ESG research as well as proprietary ESG scores to come up with a view not just on the historical performance of companies in terms of ESG but also on the sort of the potential forward-looking uh, trajectory those companies could be on and even taking it a step further looking at within ESG which factors are most material to this company or to the sector and looking at 
for instance, things like on the environmental side, um, will, car will a carbon tax be introduced and could that actually then impact this company that's operating in a jurisdiction where that could have um, a real material impact on cash flows? Uh, another example could be in the green steel sector, is there a demand for low carbon making steel um, or companies like BMW and the rest really looking at that? So is this company positioning itself to take advantage of that uh, pent up demand for low carbon steal from, from auto man, uh, manufacturers. So these are the kinds of things that we then start to do, both qualitative and quantitative, build it into our process, um, develop it into um, a score that is then used in the decision-making process of both equity and credit um, and alternative teams. And then the middle part, <laughs> and then the middle part we then engage, work closely with the companies to help them um, kind of shape and improve their ESG best practices. Um, and I think that kind of is the last, I think we just have one last slide on the net zero. So if you wanna fast forward a second to the next slide. Yeah, so this is where you'll see, I kind of mentioned before, but this is where we have um, a pretty good allocation um, of sustainable products across different elements of the portfolio. So if you're looking at your portfolio, you can actually integrate ESG and cross, across it all, both in your core, as well as in some of your sort of growth or um, more impact oriented allocations. So, um, so you can do, do it through a various different kinds of um, instruments we've developed. We have sustainability ETFs, we have uh, low carbon bond and equity funds. We're also introducing a number of different products in the impact space as well. So I encourage you to um, definitely speak with your um, investment advisor uh, to learn more. Thank you. And then we'll forward it back to Will. Yeah, you can go through these. These are, I just touched on already. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Andrea, and thank you for the introduction, Karun, earlier. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, with, with you to discuss the important and exciting topic um, of climate change and also ESG. Um, Asia is a beast. Um, it's very dynamic and they're full of emerging opportunities. Um, so Andrea has given a great overview um, of what's happening globally and what um, HSBC uh, as a group and also uh, asset management are doing. Um, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, I'll try and paint um, an Asia regional picture, starting with um, what are the various driving forces for ESG in Asia? Um, and then we'll take a look at um, what are the uh, what investors such as uh, our audience today and ourselves within asset management um, should really watch out for in, in, in the coming years. <laughs> Next slide, please. So one of the key drivers, uh, one of the key driving forces is, of course, risk, ESG risk. Um, and what I want to highlight here is um, a, a recent study that we've seen uh, ranking over 500 of the largest urban centers um, around the world on their exposure to a range of environmental and climate related threats. That shows that actually 99 out of uh, the 100 riskiest cities are all in Asia. Um, and you can see on the chart here towards the bottom, Asia is represented by the green bubbles down the center. It's very vulnerable to environmental risks compared to other regions, um, being uh, quite a few of those bubbles in the high and extreme risk. Uh, and that includes a lot of, um, say, Indian cities as well. Uh, Delhi, Kolkata, Chennai are all amongst the riskier cities, um, but also many across um, other parts of Asia as well. And what we're seeing is they're not only exposed to a range of environmental, environmental risks, such as pollution, uh, dwindling water supply, uh, extreme heat stress and natural hazards, um, such as climate change, um, but these will, of, of course, have an impact on the local communities, on the society, on the social side, uh, such as public health, uh, food prices and sanitation. So there is a clear need um, to understand how E uh, and S and G risks will impact the companies that you know, we invest in uh, and, and how the companies are managing these. Next slide, please. Uh, this is taken from uh, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report, uh, which is conducted every year, and they ask respondents from across the world to rank the biggest city risks faced by our global economy. Uh, the different colors represent the different categories. Green is environmental. Um, but I guess what I really want to highlight here is uh, you see it, they're not actually isolated risks. A lot of these are very much intertwined. They're all interconnected with other environmental, social, and economic risks. Um, so 
to really understand uh, each of these uh, issues um, also requires uh, an understanding of how they impact and affect each other um, in, uh, from a, at a systemic level. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, another driver, another driving force is uh, the demand, demand coming from uh, investors and asset owners. Uh, and so reading across some market surveys uh, on investors and what they have said, um, including uh, one that HSBC Asset Management conducted early in the year, uh, it is quite clear that ESG plays an important role in investors' decision-making and portfolio management. Um, you'll see some of the figures um, on, on the slide here. Um, what we're also seeing is actually an uptake in ESG as a result of COVID-19. Um, the pandemic has really turned the spotlight um, on a number of ESG issues, particularly S, the social factors, uh, as I'm sure the audience will, will, will relate to. Uh, issues such as employee and customer health and well-being, uh, labor practices, disaster management, supply chain management, to name a few. And, and perhaps actually the most importantly, a question we really have to ask ourselves uh, in, our invest, uh, in our investments is what is the cost of not doing anything at all? And this is something that, you know, uh, something we've been thinking about um, as part of the investment process fundamentally, uh, both at the company level, uh, at the operations, but also the supply chain uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, since the pandemic has started. <laughs> Next slide, please. And one more set of drivers I want to highlight is uh, regulatory. Um, so the regulatory landscape has actually seen an explosion of requirements um, in the past few years, both globally, um, but also uh, very much picking up the pace and accelerating in Asia. Um, this is a key driver for responsible investment um, as policymakers and regulators uh, want to put the global financial system on a more sustainable footing uh, and address the longer term issues of climate change, uh, global inequalities um, and other uh, per pervasive issues. Regulators in markets such as Hong Kong and Singapore um, have already started asking investment managers, uh, including ourselves, um, to disclose how are we thinking about managing climate and ESG risks within the portfolios? <laughs> and this is expected to spread to other locations as well. Uh, you see some of the uh, requirements and, and the uh, regulatory work that are going on around the region. Um, I won't go through every single one of them, um, but there are also increasing ESG requirements on companies um, by uh, listing exchanges and regulators. Um, so for example, Hong Kong's uh, ESG reporting requirements, uh, India, uh, in India, SEBI's uh, renewed requirements uh, on the BSR, BRSR uh, for companies uh, to report on their sustainability, uh, and also China as well. <coughs> And finally, let's not forget um, net zero and carbon neutrality commitments that um, Andrea talked about earlier. So in, in Asia, we have already seen commitments from China, Japan and Korea, uh, and likely more Asian countries to come. <clears throat> These are already seeing some ripple effects across um, lots of different sectors. Uh, and looking at examples such as China and Korea, where they have an emissions trading scheme and carbon tax in Singapore, which is being discussed in even sort of emerging uh, markets such as Indonesia as well. Next slide, please. So I think the direction of travel is very clear. Um, ESG is an integral part of all investments, uh, not just globally, but also in Asia. And it's not just only one or two funds that exclude certain sectors such as tobacco as have been the case historically, um, but actually thinking about uh, integrating ESG into the entire uh, investment portfolio across all the different asset classes and different funds. Uh, so what should we be looking out for? This, this is something, Andrea, uh, I, I guess a different version of what Andrea has shared um, earlier. Um, so this is uh, the, the, the charts here have come from the International Energy Agency, and they published the Net Zero 2050 uh, scenario report um, a few months ago. Um, so remember, we, we have to, to, to meet the Paris Agreement uh, and to have a chance of keeping global warming to within two degrees or, or even 1.5 degrees. Uh, we really have to half our global greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 uh, and reach net zero by 2050, um, as Andrea mentioned earlier. Uh, one of those, one of the key uh, ways to do that is uh, electricity generation um, and to reduce emissions here has to 
has to be has to happen more rapidly than uh, many other industries. Uh, electrification is something uh, that will uh, really support the transition to a lower carbon economy uh, and how that electri electricity is generated uh, from renewables uh, will be a key part to that. Fossil fuels will <coughs> drop from about 20, 80% of the global energy mix uh, in 2020 to only around 20% in 2050. Uh, and, and that last 20%, as Andrea mentioned, will be the, uh, the coming from the harder to abate sectors. Uh, and we'll have to think about how, how, to, actually, how to reduce the emissions from, uh, from the rest of uh, these fossil fuels. Um, and as you can see on the right-hand chart, uh, coal, oil, and gas will really diminish by, by then uh, in, in around 30 years time. Uh, if we were to uh, follow this trajectory. Uh, and these will be replaced by renewables such as wind, solar, uh, and bioenergy. So these are really some key themes to, um, to, 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 to keep an eye on and to look out for. Um, but what does it mean in practice and what are those uh, emerging trends and themes? Um, so on the chart here, um, you'll see the key mitigation measures uh, in the next 10 years uh, are really focusing on energy efficiency and renewables. Uh, things that we've been doing for actually quite a while now um, to become more energy efficient, whether it is with buildings or with our uh, production processes in our manufacturing, um, and also renewables. Uh, wind and solar have, have really been in, uh, developing for the last 10 years and really coming to cost parity now. Uh, and, and so we continue to see these two uh, categories to be uh, the key drivers for um, decarbonization for the next 10 years, and, and certainly something to keep an eye out for uh, in, 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 within the investment theme. <clears throat> After 2030, however, uh, we'll, we'll start to see pickup in uh, new technologies, emerging technologies such as hydrogen, um, as Andrea mentioned earlier, and carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Uh, these will really ramp up uh, and, and become more commercialized. Uh, we, we'll go into these in a little bit more detail in a minute, but we, we're starting to see these technologies being developed, um, a lot of investments uh, coming from companies that are actually going into them already. Um, but to, to see the real commercialization will hopefully uh, come after 2030. And, and again, definitely a uh, key categories to keep an eye out for. And then finally, I think behavior change and consumption will have to play a part as well. Uh, that these are, uh, we cannot hope to reduce, uh, to decarbonize without changing uh, sort of <clears throat> how we uh, consume and, and how uh, we use uh, our resources. Uh, so that's uh, another, uh, uh, I guess, a secondary category to think about. So on this slide, we can see that <clears throat> Um, electrification and hydrogen are playing the key roles in many sectors. Uh, hydrogen in particular will be important in addressing emissions from uh, the harder to abate sectors uh, that Andre mentioned. Uh, that cannot be fully electrified. You can't simply electrify everything. And the sectors that can be mostly decarbonized uh, through electrification, uh, you've got things like buildings, uh, light transport, electric vehicles, we've seen already, uh, two-wheeler scooters. Uh, we've, we're seeing actually uh, some uh, companies really developing electric two-wheelers in, in India, for example, and, and it, it can uh, set to be a huge market, uh, and also low-intensity heat industries. But those that cannot be electrified uh, will require high-intensity heat uh, or uh, feedstock with, within in, uh, production processes such as steel, chemicals, uh, and cement. Uh, and so this is where hydrogen will come in, things, with, things like shipping, aviation, and trucking, um, as you can see on the chart on the right-hand side. <coughs> Uh, and carbon capture and storage will also be an important play. Uh, this will be, uh, again, in, in the sectors that will be hard to uh, abate and where you still need a lot of fossil fuels. Uh, the the grey, uh, sort of the brown parts on the right hand side, things like cement, steel uh, and chemicals. <clears throat> so we've been talking a bit about hydrogen and carbon capture and storage. Um, so what are these and what do they actually mean? Um, next slide, please. Uh, so Starting with hydrogen, um, I guess uh, very uh, in, in simple terms is uh, mainly currently already used to produce heat uh, or feed into fuel cells to make electricity um, or, or for use in industrial high value chemical processes. Uh, these are the, uh, the, 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 the key uh, uses of hydrogen um, and uh, in terms of producing heat and making feeding into fuel cells will continue to be uh, uh, grow uh, as we, we expect to see that growth in the next 10 to 20 years. 
Um, so hydrogen is produced by industrial processes. Um, it doesn't occur, na occur naturally. Um, and, and industrial processes such as el electrolysis, gasification, and, and something called steam methane reforming as well. And broadly, there are three, four types of, 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 of um, how, uh, hydrogen. So you've got brown, uh, the, the brown hydrogen, these come from fossil fuels. Uh, you've got gray hydrogen, <clears throat> uh, which is where you split methane, natural gas, uh, CH4, uh, into hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And then you've got blue hydrogen. Um, so you do the same, you split methane, um, but instead of allowing the carbon dioxide to be released into the atmosphere, we, we capture it and we'll come on to the cap carbon capture in a minute. And then finally, um, Andrea mentioned earlier, green hydrogen. Um, and this is where you split water, uh, H2O, in uh, via electrolysis um, into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, so hydrogen is really gaining prominence uh, in uh, national policy agendas. Uh, we've seen uh, policy updates from, say, China, um, but also India as well. Um, government of India has uh, announced a national hydrogen mission, and, and we're uh, sort of seeing continual updates on that. Um, but also at company level, uh, we're seeing investments flowing into green hydrogen uh, within our the, the stocks in our portfolio uh, and, and actually hearing over the past six to 12 months, hearing more and more examples uh, from uh, lots of different uh, players across industries, uh, whether it's utilities, oil and gas, or even infrastructure and steel producers uh, actually thinking about already and investing heavily into green hydrogen. So this is certainly something to, uh, to, to keep an eye out on uh, across uh, these uh, larger companies uh, in these sectors. And then on carbon capture and storage, it's, uh, it's a key technology, uh, I get, uh, as, as we said earlier, for hard to abate sectors. Um, and anything you know, that still requires burning of fossil fuels by 2050 uh, will want or need to capture the, these emissions. Uh, and, and so by capturing these, and uh, typically uh, one way to do this uh, is to uh, bury permanently the carbon uh, dioxide below ground. Um, and, and in, we've seen lots of examples um, in, in, say, North America, where uh, they're using depleted oil reservoirs uh, and pumping the carbon dioxide once you've captured it to into these deep reservoirs to, to, to store it. Um, it's not at necessarily at commercial, uh, commercialized uh, stage yet, but this is, again, something we are keeping an eye out for. Okay, maybe let's look, take a look at the net zero targets that we've been uh, actually talking a lot about. So apart from the country targets from uh, uh, the uh, various countries and regions around the world, uh, it's very, also very encouraging uh, to, to see uh, or starting to see some large uh, uh, Indian companies uh, to making net zero commitments. Uh, and these are not only in carbon intensive sectors, um, such, as oil, such as oil and gas and cement, uh, as, as uh, you can see on the chart here, um, uh, some of the examples we've picked out from our portfolios, um, but also in less carbon intensive sectors, such as real estate and IT services. <clears throat> Uh, each of those will have their own key factors uh, to think about, to consider. Uh, so for example, um, the property developer, it will be about tying up with their, um, how they're doing with their energy efficiency for the buildings um, and also the demand uh, and the supply of green building cert certified buildings uh, that they are um, putting through the pipeline. Um, for oil and gas, uh, the operational emissions scope one and two will likely need the hydrogen uh, and carbon capture and storage. Uh, but something we want to keep an eye out for is the diversification into renewables and what they're going to do with the scope three emissions, i.e. the use of their products. What are they going to do? How are they going to uh, reduce the emissions from their um, uh, from, from the oil and gas that they are producing for downstream uh, users. Okay, next, next slide, please. Um, and quickly running through this, I think um, one thing do watch out for um, as you are reviewing your stocks or portfolio is uh, greenwashing. Um, this is something uh, that is uh, increasingly being picked up. Uh, so do watch out for how companies are 
uh, committing and, and what they are saying uh, in terms of the commitments and the scope. Um, there have been a number of criticisms with of these net zero targets. Um, and so uh, something when to look out for when you're assessing them is uh, how uh, what are the sort of length of these targets? Do they have in, any interim targets? What are the scope? Um, and, and also, um, are, do they have concrete plans already, such as remuneration from the board uh, being aligned to these targets, um, and also the capital uh, allocations as well? Next slide, please. And I think I'll, I'll finish um, the uh, this sort of section on uh, so while carbon, uh, low carbon transition is important, and Andrea talked a lot about this, uh, the ESG integration process earlier, I think I would also like to reiterate here the uh, necessity to really identify and evaluate uh, all the other material ESG issues. Uh, it is not just about decarbonisation and climate change. Um, it is a key theme, electrification and climate change is a key theme. You can see that on the demand charts for batteries and EVs on the left-hand side. But we should also, and we must also remember the other important ESG issues, uh, things like labour practices in supply chains, uh, such as health and safety, forced labour, child labour involved in, uh, say, the battery uh, um, uh, supply chain, uh, the environmental impacts on the local communities um, in the mining operations, um, the toxic waste, um, but also the broader corporate governance risks within the company. So these are all the issues we have to think about uh, and include as part of the, um, uh, our investment process and our investment research. Um, these will have significant impacts on the company um, and our investments, uh, regulatory and social license to operate, uh, in, as well as their reputation, and, th and therefore, ultimately, their earnings and valuations. And maybe I'll conclude on uh, if we can skip over to one more slide, please. And the last one. Okay, so I guess to conclude um, in, the, in the interest of time, I think recognizing that ESG integration uh, does mean incorporating all the in, uh, important and relevant and material environmental, social and governance factors into the investment analysis. And uh, really understanding uh, these risks and opportunities. Uh, it doesn't only enhance decision-making and risk-adjusted returns, but it also helps to address the most urgent challenges facing our planet today. And this is how we at as HFCC Asset Management thinks about uh, ESG broadly. Uh, and and <clears throat> this is integrated into all of our funds um, and, and, and our investment process. Um, our planet is facing a number of challenges um, and the scale of these uh, are huge, um, absolutely huge. Climate change, biodiversity loss, um, pollution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so what we really have to recognize is that our livelihoods and ultimately the, our sort of existence depends on having a healthy planet. Uh, and the, this will uh, in turn have an impact on our communities, society and the wider economy. Uh, and so this is why sustainability and ESG are so important uh, for us um, in, in managing our clients' money and also uh, doing, doing well while doing good. Um, so ESG has to be part and parcel of that. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Will. I think that was really a wonderful opportunity to interact with you, understanding more on res responsible investing and uh, having the uh, agenda of the climate change. We have a lot of questions coming up, and uh, let me put you the first one, uh, uh, which is clearly a thought process that has come in over the last decade, because the global temperatures have been seeing a rise and almost about 2.7 uh, degrees, and it's thought to be a leading to severe damage to the environment and the human life. How do we contain this mounting risk to the planet as the rise would be way above the target set by the Paris Climate Accord? Andrea, you want to take? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really important question. Um, that is one that we should be asking ourselves is, is what do we do to adapt in a, in a setting where the temperature rises are higher than what we plan to get to and target? Um, I think a lot of the changes that we can make to mitigate a lot of those risks between now and kind of, I would say, the next 15 or so years um, are really, I think that's kind of why I underscored the importance of the next 10 years, because it's really kind of putting in place the types of um, behaviors and um, types of like businesses that 
kind of help prevent the worst temperature rise that we could face. So for instance, um, you know, this is an interesting thing. I, I would, I'm, I'm always reading about it, but it's about kind of also the, the way we consume and grow food. Um, if you think about sort of the emissions associated with meat, um, it's, it's substantial. And, um, you know, that's to do with just the amount of land it requires and clearing of land. And, um, you know, that's not necessarily good for the environment and carbon. Um, so it's really looking at what are some new ways that we can really think about food production, meat production, alternative meat production, um, our own consumption of different kinds of, um, you know, different kinds of food and, and how we grow it. And I think, you know, this is where I think it gets really exciting and there's a lot of innovation um, happening and, you know, and a lot of investment opportunity. But I think in the next, you know, while we have this time, I think we have about eight or so years left in the carbon budget, while we have this time, really kind of thinking about our own behavior, our own uh, consumption, you know, way we consume products, um, a lot of, you know, a lot is going to happen in the next 10 years that can prevent the worst case scenario. And so it's just really clear and critical that we educate ourselves and uh, adapt our lives to move in the direction that we need to go in. Sure. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, William, uh, there's a question from Rahul uh, and he asked today, he, he asked us whether today we are moving towards EVs. I mean, for mobility, but the production of power causes a lot of pollution. How is that helping to reduce the pollution and drive the green initiative? That's a question from Rahul. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Rahul. That that is a very uh, absolutely um, very good point. Uh, the, we have to think about um, the whole system as a whole, um, and just having EVs is is not enough. Uh, if all the electricity is coming from coal-fired power plants, and, and you're absolutely right in pointing that out, and, and these uh, coal-fired electric electricity will, of course, have a significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions as well as uh, air quality, um, your uh, sulfur dioxides, your nitrous oxides, um, and, and other um, particular matter uh, that will really have an impact uh, damaging to, to, to also public health as well. Um, so uh, this is something we, we, we do uh, have to think about out in tandem with uh, with, with, with uh, the rise of EVs, um, and uh, we are seeing more and more um, uh, companies, uh, whether both in the utilities and also oil and gas sectors um, around Asia, but also in India, uh, re really investing in uh, renewables uh, and trying to um, uh, trying to uh, green the, uh, the the electricity that they generate. Um, uh, it is not, uh, and, and I, 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 I agree that it's not uh, as simple as just turning off the coal-fired power plants and switching to renewables like that um, tomorrow. Uh, that does take time to transition. Uh, there are, of course, other factors such as energy security um, and, and making sure uh, that the uh, you know people are not uh, uh, left behind as well. Um, so an idea, uh, the idea of a, a just and equitable transition. Um, so uh, as that transitions, uh, I think we'll see more investments uh, in the renewable space and and from the companies, but also from investors. And so this is definitely something uh, to to keep an eye out for. Uh, and they do have to work in tandem. Sure, William. I think that really reflects the uh, renewable energy part of it, where a lot of steps are already being taken by the corporates. Uh, and there's a question from Danish Khan, and he actually puts up, and you actually uh, put up a slide in your presentation, and that's relating to that. So how is this positive narrative going to reflect in the marketing initiatives of HSBC? I understand you had a slide on uh, HSBC aims towards net zero capability. Mm -hmm. So if you want to take that, take up that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as I said before, and actually one, one other thing just to make a point about on the transport question, because it kind of loops it all together in a very, in a good way. And I think this goes to the, to the narrative that we're talking about. But you have these kind of high intensity, high carbon intensity sectors that are sort of at kind of the top of the value chain. So they're the ones producing the cements, the steels, the chemicals that then are bought by agricultural companies, by transport companies, by um, building and infrastructure construction companies. And they tend to be what we call um, sort of upstream scope three emissions that, you know, it's a part of the carbon footprint of a transport company, for instance. So what it get when it, once you kind of decarbonize tailpipe, 
emissions and transport. And once you kind of decarbonize energy usage through things like renewables and the construction sector, you're eventually going to get back to the place of, okay, what about our materials? What about the, what we call embodied carbon in the steel we produce, in the um, cement we produce, in the chemicals we produce? And, um, and an interesting kind of just stat is that uh, met, uh, met coal, which is used mostly for, for steel making, steel is one of the largest consumers for, uh, of met coal. And if you think about if you want to really decarbonize and have a cascading effect across multiple downstream sectors, you really have to address that, that sector up at the top, which is steel, similarly with cement. So, um, so I think we think about kind of uh, certain scope one, scope two emissions, but the upstream scope three emissions are, are going to be where you see significant reductions. And that's why it's important to, to, to address those. And I kind of think leading back to this question that Tanisha asks about kind of the narrative, um, how we kind of make this sort of an opportunity that people can understand and relate to and, and implement in their portfolios. Um, it really comes down to what are our beliefs as a bank? Um, where do we, what do we stand behind? What do we um, focus on and how do we devote our resources to that? And if you think about HSBC, we're unique in that we're you know, a global bank, but we have a very deep um, network and footprint in emerging markets where most of this transition will be critical. Um, and we also have the capabilities, the networks, the, the clients that we work with in bank. Um, so there's a lot of capability and expertise that we as a bank have that's unique um, and it's going to be very important in moving the needle. And I think when we think about transition and we think about transitioning industries, we bank and work with many of the largest clients in doing that or we invest in them and have them reflected in our engagement. And so I think we have a very pivotal role to play. And then there's also kind of the opportunities that come from this. Where, where are we gonna see lots of innovation happening in Asia, for instance, around you know, alternative, um, alternative uh, proteins or circular economy or low carbon infrastructure like hydrogen, renewables, carbon capture and storage. And I think we're at the table and I think we need to be very clear and communicative about our beliefs around the importance to engage as opposed to just exclude you know, industries that may not be completely clean just yet, but are going to be critical over time that that's why we work with them. Sure, Andrea, sure. Uh, Williams, uh, some of the large polluters have actually maintained that they will be uh, a net zero emission company or polluters by end of 2050. And that's what uh, most of them maintain. But I, I think they are uh, they have provided very little, detail, little details on how they're going to achieve it. So what is your thought process on that here? Yeah. Uh, this is absolutely a, a, a something, a problem that um, we, we have to address. And uh, through our engagements uh, with the companies um, and, and our research and analysis as well, um, what does Net Zero 2015 mean? Um, it's simply not enough to just put out a target, um, a very vague target like that. And this is going back to the uh, one of the slides I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, the, the criticisms that are received by um, uh, coming from uh, the, the sort of the wider markets on net zero targets. This is something that has to be addressed. And when we look at and when we engage with companies uh, in, in, in looking at their net zero commitments, it's not just that end goal. It's also what are the interim uh, targets? What are the short term, say five years, medium term, 10 years, longer term, 20 years uh, between now and 2050? Uh, what do those look like? Um, and how much are they, how much commitment are they uh, actually making uh, in practice? How much money are they putting the money where uh, their mouth is? Uh, what is the capital allocation uh, in, 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 in the next uh, sort of three to five years? What does that cap capital allocation cycle look like? Uh, what are the technologies uh, that they are looking at? Um, are they part of initiatives uh, or uh, whether it's with academia or other research organizations um, or, or industry partnerships to, to look at and think about um, how to really decarbonize, uh, you know, especially the, uh, the harder to abate sectors, right? Um, and, and, and also, um, you know, is, is the exec are the executives and board remuneration tied to uh, achieving these targets or are they just saying it um, and, and having actually no, no teeth underneath? Um, and, and I guess finally, um, the one thing we, we do uh, look at is uh, understanding uh, what, you know, what, what they, how they compare to their peers um, and this, 
you know, are the targets, do the target, targets make sense? Um, are, are they um, <clears throat> are they comparable to their peers, but also are they comparable to the Paris agreements? Are they science-based um, or is it something that they are just putting out and then something, oh, actually we can achieve uh, very easily already? So thanks. Uh, conscious of the time and we have just three minutes left, uh, I have several questions flowing in on my uh, Q&A box, but I'll take this last one, uh, which is from Gotham. And uh, this is very apt in the current times as he talks about cryptocurrencies and mining of crypto uh, currencies. Uh, I presume that uh, it consumes a lot of energy and might leave carbon footprints. How can one keep a check on that? Andrea, you want to take that? So it's links, I think, with the carbon footprint. Um, I think it depends a little bit on, um, you know, on the one hand, it, there could be a carbon footprint. On the other hand, it could also be um, uh, probably a responsible sort of mining uh, best practices as well. So it actually could also involve not just really E, but also S and G. Um, so when we're when we're looking at um, a number of different, um, you know, kinds of sectors across the mining, metals and mining, what you'll tend to find is actually, uh, this is a very tricky part of the whole value chain. Um, it's one that a lot of um, industries really struggle with, which is understanding how do you, how can you really confirm that where you're sourcing your material from is actually from a, um, a, a mine or a country where they have certain standards in place, uh, like the responsible mining, international mining standards. So, um, so that's, I know, a big a big issue is really just how can you ensure the sustainability of the supply chain and, and best practices around uh, social and governance of that. Um, in terms of the carbon footprint, I actually haven't come across as much on that just yet. Um, I would actually be keen if Will, if maybe you might have some thoughts on that. Um, but it, of course, there is a quite a substantial amount of um, you know energy need. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming through things like the data centers and. Um, infrastructure that's used in place to kind of monitor and help support this growth. Yeah, sure. I, I think this is something uh, uh, you, you might have seen in the news as well. Uh, the Chinese government has been uh, cracking that down on. And part of that is uh, absolutely to do with the energy that's being used, uh, the, the vast amount of energy that's being used. And, and actually, as uh, in general, uh, when we look at the uh, internet and e-commerce sector, um, you know, historically, uh, uh, the uh, e-commerce and internet sector um, would have a bunch of uh, a range of ESG issues and environmental uh, issues don't very feature very much. But actually, now we're starting to see more and more carbon footprint uh, and energy management and energy efficiency. Uh, from from these big in, uh, internet names uh, it is starting to become actually quite material because exactly precisely because of their uh, the, the use of electricity in the data centers uh, and uh, for, for all the services that are provided cloud computing and everything um, and and in China for example they they have uh, very strict uh, rules and, and, and regulations around where you can build a new data center and how close to uh, say a, 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 a city, um, a tier one city, for example, that you can build one. Um, so, and, and so the, these are, uh, we're starting to definitely see more regulations around it, um, but also uh, mindful of the upstream uh, 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 emissions that it, uh, Andrea talked about. So not only thinking about what the product or service in silo, but actually the, uh, the life cycle and the whole value chain. Sure. Thanks, Andrea. And thanks, uh, Will. I think that was really a great session, uh, understanding more on responsible investing and climate. And of course, ESG has been the core for all the corporates that uh, have been there in this environment. Uh, thank you for being here, Swat. Uh, uh, this was an excellent session, and we look forward to having more of such sessions with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.